Okay, so we covered last time a little bit about cellular death. We talked about apoptosis, which is considered pre-programmed cellular suicide. And uh, necrotic cellular death is where we have death of uh, tissues that or cells that have been injured. Okay, so we went through the different types of apoptosis. And then we covered necrosis too? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to talk about the different types of, um, once necrosis happens, the different types of problems that somebody can have. For instance, liquefaction, coagulation, cassius, and then gangrenous necrosis. Okay. And then uh, cell content is released when all these things happen. Inflammation uh, can also result from this. So one of the things that you see here is this is necrosis of the cells and the nucleus of the cells becoming pycnotic. So if you remember, pycnotic means that the nucleus shrinks up and becomes much darker in size because the chromatin is all uh, curled together. And then you have karyorexis where the nucleus is fragmented. So let's see, looks like right here you have some karyorexis, that's a fragmented nucleus. These smaller nuclei are the pycnotic nucleus. And then you also have karyolysis, where you have cells that have no nucleus at all. They've just dissolved completely out. Uh, the term autolysis means that the dead cell is being digested by its own lysosomes, whereas heterolysis is the cell being digested by white blood cells in the body, so macrophage coming around and causing digestive, uh, digestion of those cells. So when necrosis happens, uh, what's going to occur is that the cell is going to start to swell up, water is going to start entering into the cell, uh, the chromatin is going to become pycnotic, so it's going to be smaller, it's going to condense, but as the fluid comes in, all that swelling of the cell uh, actually causes destruction of the organelles of the cell. It causes the cell to release lysosomes, or excuse me, digestive enzymes from the lysosomes and starts to basically digest itself. And then eventually uh, the inflammation from the water, okay, entering the cell, will also then bring macrophage into this area and a new type of uh, inflammatory response occurs because you're going to bring in neutrophils and release uh, histamines and then you're going to get a different type of inflammatory response and then the cell itself is destroyed. So this is kind of what we're seeing with coagulation necrosis. So this is a type of cellular death and uh, death comes to groups of cells and most often this is due to a loss of blood supply. So uh, some things happen where maybe there's an occlusion, blood can't flow to a certain area, and now you have ischemia, and then you have hypoxia, and these organs or these areas of the body are going to start to go through coagulation necrosis. This is the most common type of necrosis we see in the body. And what happens is the cells, as they're dying, uh, they actually get kind of this gel-like look to them. Okay, so when the cells are freshly dead, they sort of look kind of like a gel type of substance. So I just want to read this to you. Grossly, the dead area is likely to be soft and pale. After a while, it's likely to shrink and turn yellow. And the reason it's turning yellow is because when uh, this type of necrosis occurs, a lot of the fatty tissue is um, going to start to trap what are called tryptophans, which is a type of amino acid. And that amino acid is going to give that fatty tissue more of a yellowish color. Uh, the microscopy of these cells is distinct after loss of their nuclei. Okay, so what do we call it when you don't have a nuclei at all? It becomes pycnotic, it goes through karyorexis, and then we call the last one 
karyolysis, and no nuclei at all, the cells have what's referred to as a tombstone appearance. So these cells, they have fluid on the inside, uh, but they're kind of elongated, and there's no nucleus inside that cell. And so <laughs> under a microscope, they kind of look like a little bit of a tombstone. Now, eventually, <laughs> these cells become more inflamed, and the dead cells are removed by our white blood cells. So unless otherwise specified, the death of a group of cells will be the result of coagulation necrosis because, again, it's the most common type. Okay, so it has that kind of yellowish sort of color to it, like a yellow-brown color, and that, again, is because the fat is coming to the surface, okay? And the type of coagulation necrosis, again, you can see it almost looks like he's got this sort of brownish gel on the outside of his hand. Okay, and that's what they're talking about like with that gel-like substance. Now, this is coagulation necrosis in the liver. And this is due to uh, cirrhosis of the liver. And there's not a lot of good blood flow to the liver. And so around the edges is where you see the necrosis. It's more of that kind of yellower color. And if you were to feel that liver, uh, the inside would be more firm, but the outside would feel kind of gel or jelly-like. This is microscopic, and this is in the kidneys, and you can see uh, in this area, this is where the coagulation occurs. So these are the tubules of the kidneys. These look really good. That's not a problem there. But all of this up here, that doesn't look the same. And so where you see these little black spots, these are actually white blood cells or macrophage coming into the area to destroy the cells that have died. This right here is actually the coagulation necrosis. And this uh, kind of in the darker brown sort of color is all of the lysosomes releasing their digestive enzymes. And fat is going to start building up all in this area. And you can see it right here. It'll start looking that gel-like substance. And this, again, is usually due to ischemia. Liquefactive necrosis is the next type. And cell death occurs where the dead tissue dissolves more into fluid. So it's not as much of a gel. It's more of a liquid. Okay. And when the cells die, they're rapidly destroyed by lysosomal enzymes. Now, liquefactive necrosis usually is going to occur like rattlesnake bites or if someone has uh, a type of bacterial infection, especially clostridia. Now, you get clostridia uh, where you'll have open wounds that don't uh, get washed. You can get clostridium in, uh, in those. Uh, we can see this in the uh, intestines as well. You can have this type of infection. And people who uh, try to commit suicide, you'll see liquefactive necrosis with them when they're committing suicide in such a way that they're drinking lye. And so this will happen to their esophagus mainly. It just becomes very liquidy and sort of dissolves away. Uh, the tissue is in a liquid form and sometimes sort of a creamy, yellow, pussy type of look to it as well. So you can see this looks very different. It doesn't have that more gel-like look to it. Uh, this is liquefactive necrosis and so is this here. So this is a lung and you have liquefactive necrosis here and you also have it right here. And both of these are what we would call abscesses in the lungs. Those areas, those regions of the lungs have just turned to a liquidy type of center. And again, this is looking at that lung abscess and all these little black dots here, those are all macrophage moving into this area to dissolve all of that uh, dead tissue. Okay? And of course, you know what the lungs are supposed to look like and that doesn't look like lung tissue at all which of course also means that the lungs can't perform their appropriate function when this necrosis occurs. There is a type of necrosis called fat necrosis, and this is necrosis specifically of fatty tissue. Now we usually see this type of fat as retroperitoneal fat. So what does retroperitoneal mean again? 
Okay, so it's outside, not behind, but outside of the peritoneal membrane. Because keep in mind, the kidneys might be retroperitoneal behind on the dorsal surface of the body, but the bladder is retroperitoneal in front or on the ventral surface. So retroperitoneal really means outside of the peritoneal membrane. Now, usually fatty uh, necrosis happens retroperitoneally, but like in the case of pancreatitis, where somebody has inflammation of the pancreas, you can have the fat that typically surrounds the pancreas become necrotic and start to dissolve away. So how that's happening is due to the fact that the pancreas can, you know, secrete digestive enzymes naturally, but if we have any type of inflammation of the pancreas, it may start to secrete too many digestive enzymes and start to digest fats where it's not supposed to. One of those digestive enzymes is lipase, and it can actually uh, break apart so much fat that you have something called saponification. And saponification is the term we use when we take fats and turn them into soap. Okay, so in the good old days when people made soap, that's what they started from. They started from a fatty substance and uh, they were able to produce soap from this, like glycerin is found in soap, and that comes from triglycerides, which is fat, okay? So you can see this kind of uh, waxy, soap looking like fat all around the outside of the pancreas where it's not supposed to be. Now sometimes what will happen too is that calcium ions start to uh, migrate into this fat, and when that happens, it will actually harden the fat, okay? So this is what you're seeing right here. This is actually fat inside the pancreas, and that's what this is right here. It is calcified fat. And so this individual's pancreas definitely wasn't going to work appropriately. Now this is also fat, and uh, it, fat is not supposed to be this color at all. Excuse me, it's a whitish, <coughs> a whitish yellow color, and it's definitely not supposed to be so rigid. That's, uh, fat is a lot more flexible than this, uh, but because of the way that this fat is actually falling apart, it becomes a little bit more hardened when the calcium uh, invades it. And that's what these lighter colors are here. There's a lot of calcium in this region. And then all the darker regions around the edges uh, this is where the fat is really going through necrosis. And so, um, I gotta tell you, this stuff really stinks. It reeks when fat goes through necrosis. So, these are adipose cells here on the right, and they're completely healthy. But you can see all through here, these are necrotic adipose cells. They are definitely not doing what they're supposed to do. Now, caseous necrosis, the term caseous means cheese, and so this type of necrosis, the cells start to kind of take on a cheesy type of look, almost like cottage cheese, but we only see this with tuberculosis infections, okay? So we don't really see this with anything else. And all the cells in the area where the tuberculosis is located are going to die, and the tissue starts to actually kind of crumble, and one of the problems with this is it can also aerosolize. So that means these cells, if you know, somebody goes and blows on them, these cells can just come off. They're what we would call friable because they're very crumbly cells. And it looks like a kind of a cheesy sort of look. Now this is Cassius necrosis. And it's more of a liquidy form right now. Uh, but this will actually uh, harden and then become more of a powder later. Those are the lungs. These, this is lung tissue also, and you can see all the necrosis here. And again, all those dark little spots, those are all macrophage coming in, trying to get rid of all of these dead cells. And same thing here. The little black spots are macrophage everywhere. Now, you also have gangrene or gangrenous necrosis. Now, Gangrene isn't a separate type of necrosis, like we have fatty necrosis and caseous necrosis. Gangrene can be 
part of any of those types of necrosis, okay? And it's defined as gradual destruction of living tissues. And these, all these types of necrosis are very gradual. They don't happen overnight. Gangrene comes on due to the obstruction of blood flow. There's not enough oxygen to a particular area of the body, and it can become gangrenous. Uh, it's, like I said, not a separate type of necrosis, but a term for necrosis that is advanced, and you can visibly see it. So the Latin word uh, for gangrene is an eating sore. So basically for us, simple, gangrene is death and decay of a body part. Uh, a large area of ne necrotic tissue is what we're looking at with gangrene, and it can go into either what we would call dry gangrene or wet gangrene. Okay? The dry doesn't smell nearly as bad as the wet. That stuff is just like, mm -mm -mm. fun. Uh, dry gangrene happens because there's a lack of arterial blood flow. Uh, but venous blood flow is still occurring, so wherever the tissue is becoming gangrenous, Blood isn't coming in, but it is flowing out. So now imagine that tissue is going to become more dry because it's not getting its supply and nutrients of blood in, but the fluid is leaving that area. Wet gangrene is the opposite. You can still get blood into the area somewhat, but you don't have blood flowing out venous-wise. So fluid starts to accumulate in this area and it starts to liquefy with the infection. There's also one other, uh, which is not quite as common, but this is gas gangrene, and this happens with clostridium infections. And it produces a toxin, and it also produces hydrogen sulfide. Now, hydrogen sulfide is that type of gas that uh, when you smell it, it tastes like, or it smells like rotten eggs. Have you ever smelled that? Okay, that's what this type of uh, gas is. And I'll show you some of the bubbles that occur on people. Okay, so dry gangrene, there's mostly coagulation necrosis going on here. Uh, typically you get the blackening, the desiccating or drying out of whatever the area is, maybe like the foot or the fingers type of thing. Uh, and this is going to happen before you get a lot of bacteria growth in the area. So when it's really dry on the tissues, bacteria don't do well, okay? They don't like a desert environment. They like it to be much more wet. And so if our body dries out or desiccates, bacteria is going to say, eh, right, nah, I don't think so. I don't want to live here anymore. Okay, so dry gangrene, like I said, is usually free of infection. And it many times is brought on by like a blood clot or poor circulation to an area, okay? And so these are just some pictures of dry gangrene. I really like the one down here at the lower right where the guy can take his finger on and off if he pleases. Uh, here's another one where the person just uh, let it go for too long and they amputated that part of the foot. And then we have somebody who's had parts of the toes, or the side, excuse me, the side of the foot amputated. So basically what's happening is uh, you can have something like E. coli enter into the bloodstream. And one of the things that happens when you get a bacterial infection is the bacteria, no matter which kind it is, releases toxins. And these toxins, very interestingly, mess with blood flow. So E. coli, for instance, what it will do is when its toxins are released, it can cause blood pressure to become very, very low. Now, how it does that is it vasodilates arteries. So E. coli releases certain chemicals that can cause vasodilation of the arteries and blood flow goes down. Now, or I should say blood pressure goes down, but then that also means blood flow goes down, right? If you don't have enough pressure, you can't circulate. Now, because the blood pressure's gone down and blood flow's gone down, 
our body tries to release things to make blood pressure go back up, to preserve circulation. Okay, makes sense. As soon as our blood pressure goes down. Now, the problem is our body overcompensates because the toxins have made the blood vessels get too big and blood pressure goes down. Our body makes the arteries become too small. It vasoconstricts too much. And now <coughs> blood pressure, although it's gone up, you have such vasoconstriction, especially to the limbs, that blood just cannot really flow to those areas. And what it does is it helps to keep the blood in the vital area, but it doesn't allow blood to go to the limbs. And now uh, you're going to have necrosis of these limbs, and you're going to end up with uh, eventually a type of dry gangrene. So wet gangrene is mostly liquefactive necrosis. That makes sense. Uh, I like how they put this. Uh, the typical foul-smelling, oozing foot infected with several different kinds of bacteria kind of gives you a feel for that. I just quoted that from a book I read. Mm -hmm. I really wish you could do PowerPoints that sent out the smell so you <laughs> could really get into this. And very often uh, it could be in a body cavity so you can get this kind of wet gangrene like internal organs and all. Uh, this would be a person who had diabetes and you can see uh, basically their whole bottom part of the leg became gangrenous because there just wasn't enough blood flow. Uh, this is another person with diabetes, and uh, you can see what happened to this. It's more of a wet gangrene. Are you choking on this? Yes. <laughs> Y'all are the ones who picked to go into medicine. Right? <laughs> Everybody's making you go. My personal one is this one. I just really enjoy this. What I don't understand is why do you let it get this far? I know. <laughs> okay. Now, I got to tell you, I, I had a great aunt. She's deceased now. And uh, she lived on a big farm, and uh, she cut herself one day on her thigh. And my mother is a nurse, so she called my mother over, and uh, it was very dirty. And so they washed it all out. But she had wet gangrene going on within just a couple of weeks because even though my mother showed her how to wash it out and rebandage it and everything, she wasn't interested. Absolutely not interested. And within a month, she ended up dying because she absolutely was not interested in going to the doctors either. And it looked, I can remember, even though I was a little kid, I can remember it looked very much like this, but eventually it turned really green and just, mm, yeah, you well, didn't want to be in the room with her. Because she, um, she stuck. <laughs> and so this is a picture of a diabetic foot. Okay. So we know what happens with diabetes. You have those high sugar levels. The arteries become eventually scarred and fats and cholesterols and all stick to it. And then you can't get blood flow to these areas. Uh, and then you have patients who are confined to their beds and may get bed sores. And this is one of the reasons why you have to move them all the time. Because they get those uh, pressure areas and those pressure areas get hot and there's not good blood flow if they're laying you know, on, let's say, their buttocks or their hip for too long or their heels. It happens on their heels a lot. And eventually you'll get necrosis of the tissue and that can potentially go into gangrene. Uh, this is wet gangrene of the intestines. And so one of the other things that happens, even if it's not clostridium, uh, the bacteria that's involved here will start releasing toxins that begin to accumulate gases, especially in the intestines. And so you have to be really careful because your small intestine should not be this big. So if it's this big, what does this tell you? It's full of gas. And if you accidentally move this stuff the wrong way, it'll pop. And you don't want to do that because then all the beautiful odors, odors start coming out. So you want to be real gentle whenever you see this stuff. You don't want any of that coming out. Clostridial gangrene is the gas gangrene, okay? Uh, and it, again, is from dirty wounds 
and you get the clostridium in there and it's making those hydrogen sulfide bubbles. And here are the bubbles. Okay. And now you can see the swelling and the inflammation that occurs. That purple color is due to lack of blood flow. And those tissues are breaking down because the clostridium is releasing uh, all of its toxins. And again, if those things burst, which by the way, you'll have to pop them for healing to start to occur and debridement and all. Whew, you probably want a respirator on when you do that. There's one other I wanted to show you because I'm sure that the guys in this class will like this one. This is called Fournier's gangrene, and it's gangrene of the scrotal sac, which they call the dreaded black sac disease. <laughs> Ow. That just does not look like it's fun. So you can see the scrotal sac just swells something fierce, and you can almost not even see a penis because all of this tissue is so swollen here. Uh, and if it looks painful, that's because it is. Okay, <laughs> just want to make sure that you know that. There, any of these types of gangrene, uh, except maybe the dry gangrene, is very painful for the patient because there's inflammation of all the neurons. Keep in mind, anytime blood does not flow to certain tissues, our body wants us to know the blood isn't flowing. So one of the things the body does is it releases enkephalins. So if you remember, enkephalin is the chemical that stimulates nociceptors, tells us that we're having pain, okay? And so lack of blood flow is usually very painful. It's not something you, you know, just can ignore. All right, so we're done with this one, and we're going to move right along into the next section, which happens to be disorders of the immune system. a case study last week? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to grade it and I just realized I forgot to grade your case study, so I'll have it for you next week. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Alright, so there's four major categories of immune mechanisms or the immune response. If you remember, we have the humoral or the antibody mediated immunity. These have to do with our B lymphocytes. And then we have the cell mediated immunity, which is all about T lymphocytes. And then we have complement system, and we have phagocytosis. And phagocytosis is going to include your neutrophils and your good old macrophage. Now, somebody tell me, what do B cells do for us? What are they all about? You all who had micro? I'm going to tell Mr. Gibbs, you can't remember anything. <laughs> What's the B cell all about? They, they stimulate the T cells, don't they? Mm, no. It's the opposite. T cells stimulate the B cells. But what do B cells make for us? Antibodies. Antibodies. Excellent. Okay. Your brain is picking it up again. <laughs> probably been a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So we have two major players when we talk about the T cells. One is a helper T cell, which is the CD8 cell. What's the other one? CD4. The CD4. I like to call that the good old cytotoxic T cell. Okay. So we're going to talk about each one of these, and then we'll talk about complement and all that kind of good stuff as we go along. So there's two types of immune defenses. We have the innate or sometimes called non-specific immunity, and then we have adaptive or specific immunity. Now, non-specific would be like the cells that uh, make up your skin, or you have saliva in your mouth that have some enzymes that help to kill bacteria. Okay, you have enzymes in your tears. So if you get certain bacteria in your eye, the enzymes help to kill all those bacteria also. So these are your innate or your non-specific types of immunity. Whereas adaptive 
or specific immunity is uh, uh, called the second line of defense, and that happens uh, with your T cells and your B cells and your complement and all those things that we were talking about. Uh, this is a stronger, you might say, response to something trying to invade the body. So when we look at innate immunity, okay, so again, the innate is the nonspecific. When you're looking at innate immunity, I told you the skin, which is our epithelial barrier. You do have, very close to the surface of the skin, you've got a lot of phagocytes hanging out. So let's say that, you know, maybe you uh, get a splinter in your hand. Uh, you're going to have a lot of neutrophils and a lot of monocytes. These are types of phagocytes that are going to come into this area, and they're going to start the inflammatory response. Okay? So what chemical, can you remember, is actually released from these neutrophils and monocytes that begins the inflammatory response. There's a very particular chemical they're releasing. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's histamine. Look at you. You do remember. So one of the first things we see is we see an increase in histamine in this area. Now, the next question is, what the heck is this histamine doing for us? Well, one of the things that histamine can do is cause the blood vessels in the area, let's say, that where the splinter is. Okay, let's just use the splinter as an example. In the area where the splinter is, the histamine can cause all the blood vessels to vasodilate. What happens to blood flow in blood vessels that vasodilate? It goes down, right? Because blood pressure goes down, you don't have as much blood flow, blood flow is going down. So we've got this type of blood vessel, okay, that histamine is attacking, and we get this vasodilation of this blood vessel, and all the blood flow in here is decreased. Right? Now, that also means that blood is pooling in this region because blood flow has gone down, it's slowed down, it gets to pool. Now, when blood pools anywhere, one of the things that blood releases is heat. Now, remember, in every single metabolic reaction in our body, there's always a couple of things that are occurring. One, you're producing some kind of product, right? Mm -hmm. But you're also producing some kind of waste product, mm -hmm. and you're producing heat. So inside every little cell, we produce lots of heat. Now, if those cells get too hot, they'll fall apart. So the heat radiates out of the cells and gets into our blood. And the blood transports that heat to the surface of the body and the heat radiates out of our body, okay, so that we don't get too hot and burn up and die. And if blood flow slows down, there's going to be in this area an increase in heat. And one of the side effects of histamine being released and blood flow slowing down is that you have an increase in heat given off from the body. And this is part of inflammation. Now, if blood is slowing down in the region where, let's say, we have that splinter again, you may, depending on the color of the person's skin, you may be able to see that in that area also it's very red because the blood is pooling underneath the surface and you get more of a red color. Oops, not read, red. Oh, that's the wrong kind of red, huh? So with inflammation due to histamine, you have an increase in heat, you have an increase in the coloration of it, 
And then remember, if this is pooling in one particular area, then you're also going to have an increase in blood pressure here, just in this area where it's pooling. And any time you have more blood pressure in one area of a blood vessel, what's going to happen is you're going to release fluid into the tissues. Fluid gets pushed out of that blood vessel into these tissues and now you have edema. So with inflammation we know it's red, we know it's hot, we know there's swelling in that area and because all this fluid is being pushed into the tissues you get this swelling or this edema it's pressing on pain neurons. It's pressing on nociceptors. That fluid is creating a response in your neurons and you have an increase in pain. These are the four major symptoms of inflammation. Redness, heat, swelling, pain. Now also because there are a lot of macrophage in the area you may also develop what we would call pus. Macrophage are kind of interesting because one of the things that macrophage can do is they can release a chemical which is HCLO. This chemical is called hypo chloride. Probably you don't recognize that, but if I tell you the slang for this chemical is bleach, you probably recognize that, huh? Now how weird is that? Our macrophage can actually produce bleach. And they release this hypochlorite wherever there's a problem. So I get a splinter in my hand, let's say, and my macrophage all come to this area because I have all this inflammation that draws the macrophage to that area and the macrophage releases bleach. Now that bleach will definitely, over time, dissolve that splinter. No doubt about it. It can do the job. But the other problem is it can also dissolve all the cells around the splinter as well. So this pus is just nothing more than dead cells. Now it could kill off some bacteria that might have tried to get in there with the splinter or whatever, but it's also killing off good cells, which is one of the reasons why when you get a splinter and you leave it in there for a while, it hurts because our own macrophage are creating a problem. This is the same thing that happens when you get some type of virus or bacteria in your throat and after a while you get a sore throat. The sore throat is not from the bacteria. The sore throat is from your macrophage trying to kill off the bacteria, and what it's doing is it's pouring bleach down the back of your throat. Cool, huh? Thank you very much, macrophage, for the sore throat. But that's the only way it knows to be able to kill off this bacteria. Now, after a while, what the macrophage will also do is they will release chemicals called cytokines. Anybody remember what the heck cytokines do? Like apoptosis. Say it again? Apoptosis. Um, maybe. What else? What, what else do cytokines do? They can actually... They signal good. cytotoxic cells? They do. They can signal those good old T cells. They can bring in the CD8 cells, or what we used to call the helper T cells. And they can also signal in the cytotoxic T cells. So if this splinter gets bad enough and I start getting bacteria invading into this area, I may need to up my game and I may need to go from just a regular old innate, not a big deal response, just some inflammation going on to kill off this bacteria, try to get rid of this splinter. Now there's a potential for me to get really sick from this. This is an open wound, more bacteria is coming in, I need a bigger response, so I'm going to go to the adaptive immunity. And I'm going to bring in 
the helper T cells, which are also going to help to bring in the cytotoxic T cells. So in the adaptive immunity, we're able to recognize and react to large numbers of microbes, or maybe not even microbial substances, but other things as well, which we'll talk about. And then these types of lymphocytes have identification capabilities. That means that they can remember certain pathogens. Okay, so if you remember memory T cells as well. So a lot of times, if I get sick from something that my immune system has never seen before, it actually could take a little bit of time for them to recognize this disease. But if my immune system has seen it before and been able to overcome this disease, then the next time that it gets into my body, whatever that pathogen is, my immune system goes, oh, no, 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 we're going to have a much quicker response. So for instance, <clears throat> let's talk about the measles. So we know that the measles are starting to go around, okay? So let's say a person hasn't been vaccinated at all and they get the measles. Now the reason that it's not going to be a lot of fun is because when they catch that pathogen, the immune system is kind of like, huh, not exactly sure what to do with this guy, never seen them before. Do we kill them? Do we let them go? What exactly do we do? And so it gives the measles time to spread and do its dirty work in your body and begin to make you sick. And then after about maybe 10 days, the immune system goes, oh, yeah, okay, maybe we should start trying to mount a response, okay, and kill this off. And if you're lucky and you have a good immune system, your immune system will win. But sometimes if your immune system is, like, not so hot, maybe you have an autoimmune disease, maybe there's something else wrong with you where your immune system isn't working so well, when your immune system finally figures out what it's supposed to do, unfortunately it could be too late. Now, by the way, we're not really talking about measles, but since measles are kind of breaking out on the West Coast, mm -hmm. probably a good thing for you to know about this. Um, you're probably not immune to them if you've been vaccinated. Okay. There's a high probability that your immunity isn't any good anymore. See, what we used to think was if you gave people just a little tiny bit of the measles or a little bit tiny bit of the mumps, then we'd make those memory cells, our immune system would fight these guys, and we'd make those memory cells, and those memory cells would last forever from a vaccine. They don't. They seem to last, eh, give or take, around 20 years. So some of you may be still okay if you're young enough, but some of you may not. And now here's the big problem. Not necessarily that you're going to die from this, but if you are at the age where you are going to have children and you are pregnant when you get this disease, there is a high probability that your child will die from this or have massive injuries from this. So there can be blindness, there can be mental retardation, there can be all kinds of issues. And this is from measles, this can be from mumps, and especially rubella. That's what Rose did her presentation in physio on, okay? And when I was a kid, you, we didn't have those vaccines really that much, and that's exactly what you would see with a lot of babies that were born. So it, you got to keep in mind, you might not want to vaccinate your child, but when your child grows up, what's going to happen when she gets pregnant with your grandchild? What will happen to that baby? Your child may be okay. I mean, I've had the measles five times. I survived. People survive the measles. It happens. People die from the measles. It happens, okay? It wasn't fun. Let me tell you, not a good disease. Rubella, worse than the measles. Mumps, horrible. Wish I had been vaccinated. Had them all. But people live. But the big problem is, it's not that you're going to die. It's that you're going to have lasting effects from these. Okay, so for instance, contracting the measles... We believe the measles are the major reason for people developing autoimmune diseases. You are far less likely to develop an autoimmune disease later in life if you never had the measles in life. 
So you have a much greater risk of developing multiple sclerosis than somebody who's never had the measles. So it's not necessarily the disease itself that could kill you. It's the after effects of what these viruses and all do to you or maybe the children that you have and that kind of thing. And so I want you to also know you are probably not immune to the measles. So it's not just your two-year-old that could catch it. It's also you. Okay? Me, I'm immune. It's not going to happen. Because for some reason when you get the disease, your memory cells seem to be really good at remembering. Now, I don't know about the measles. I might get that again because I've freaking had it five times. My memory cells can't remember anything, <laughs> which is how I am. I can't remember anything, so it doesn't surprise me my memory cells are stupid too, okay? It just, one of my kids said, did you remember to do this? I'm like, you never even told me to do that. She goes, oh no, I videotaped myself telling you. <laughs> and she showed me the video. I'm like, I do not even remember. Remember, you videotaping even showing me. Okay, so that's, that's how bad my memory is. 